Hello, hello, and welcome to Live Learning Empires. I'm your host, Nagin Serafi. I'm the head of Disco U, and I'm joined here by the amazing Amandine Bressand and Simon Engelka. Welcome, and thank you for being here today for both of you. We have an amazing session planned for you today. Simon is the founder and chairman of Battery Associates and Battery MBA, and Amandine is the chief of staff. And you have just in over a year built an incredible virtual academy, which I can't wait to deep dive into with you today because we have lots of people People here today and who'll be you know watching this session afterwards who are building their own virtual academies boot camps and micro schools and you have so much wisdom and insight to share now just so that folks understand what we're working with here you are um you know the battery associates it's is a consulting firm it's a it's an innovation lab and you've built out this education arm to help you know bring this revolution to the world and so i want to pass it over to you i want to understand from your perspective, what was the origin story? Why did you build an education arm for your business? How is the Virtual Academy going? Tell us a little bit more about Battery MBA. Well, thank you so much for having us. It's absolutely delight and yeah, it's, it's also really, really great to, to work with you. And I think maybe just to give you a bit of context, um, where kind of the Battery MBA is kind of you know started, um, as mentioned, we started a bit over a year ago now in, in January 2021. And the idea was really, you know, I mean, also with my background, I was a, a battery engineer, battery scientist, you know, from by training, did my PhD in the UK, was in the US before, really had this, you know, beautiful kind of trajectory on, on research. But essentially, battery MBA is really what I wish I would have had um, when I kind of you know, was in this position, something really giving me the insight, what's happening in industry, what's happening around the world, really, you know, what's, you know, all these different developments, and really trying to understand this puzzle of battery. So it's a quite a, you know, niche in some way, it's a quite a specific topic, but actually it's very complex. It includes different areas from all the way from mining, how to mine your materials responsibly, um, to, you know, how do we produce kind of materials and cells and how do we, you know, build these batteries which end up in our EVs. And then also all these other topics from recycling and policy and business, and really trying to create a program which really helps you to understand this big puzzle and step by step, like, you know, put together all these different pieces. So, yeah, it really came from my own desire. And um, I think that always really helps, of course, if you build something you would like to take yourself. And in some way I am every single time it happens. But one of the things that I find so interesting is, that you know, you're focused on a hyper niche market, which I find sometimes, you know, when folks are building their academies, like there's a bit of fear around focusing on a niche market and thinking maybe there aren't enough learners to reach. But I really, you know, when we had our original conversations, one of the things you shared was that, you know, the in Europe alone, there's 800,000 possibilities for these battery uh, leaders, really what, you, what you're calling them. And I just thought that was incredible because it, it is a hyper niche market, but it's actually quite a large market for you. And so you've developed this 12 week program and you're keeping the cohorts kind of rather small, but you're running them multiple times a year. So I'm just interested to know with this kind of niche learner, what is your approach to learning design and how are you people, how are you taking people through a journey in those 12 weeks? Oh, that's a great question. And again, thanks so much for having us today. We're really thrilled to, to share our story with you. Um, as you say, it is a niche market, but a very rapidly growing sector. And as you pointed out, the European Battery Alliance estimates that we'll need to train and upscale 800,000 people in Europe alone by 2025. So that market is growing. And we also know, as Simon pointed out, that the profiles um, of professionals in the sector are widely different. So we basically created a course that would, you know, allow for enough flexibility for people to take on the kind of knowledge and engage with the kind of knowledge that they really needed. But also we really wanted to create a community of battery professionals. And I think that allows us to make and maintain the course content very dynamic over time. So in terms of kind of big picture learning, you know, uh, journey uh, for learners. I think that's a very important component that we chose to emphasize on. Simon, is there anything you wanted to add on that? No, I think you summarized it really well. And I think that's something, you know, I think often it's a bit scary to kind of go after mm -hmm. in some way of a niche. But I think also really helps you to know your market well, right? I think when we started, 
you know, we had an even smaller niche in mind, right? We really had this idea of kind of PhDs, you know, similar to myself in the battery sector, right? Who want to get this other experience. And then we kind of, you know, we're kind of also amazed in how this niche grew now from people from investment, people from all these different sectors, Amity mentioned as well. And actually sometimes you realize your niche is quite much bigger than you thought it might even be. So I think, you know, be brave and address the needs uh, of a niche. Yeah, and I, and I remember one of the things you said was kind of like, you're thinking about this as lifelong learning too, because it's it's a field where people aren't just going to come in for one program and then that's it. They're one one and done and they move on. But there's actually you continue there's continuous learning in this field, and so you're thinking about that as you continue to build out different programs and different offerings. So that's really incredible that you were able to not only identify a niche but also identify that this niche needs continuous learning was that something you you had envisioned kind of from the beginning or was that something that came up in your kind of experience of running the course and understanding what the needs were of the learners i mean i can start here i think that need for ongoing and continuous training is also inherent to the battery sector and so we know that the battery sector is fairly new depending on how you look at it but essentially a lot of the research is still in development and a lot of the you know, new technologies and its commercialization is only happening now. So I think the dimension and, and the way in which we, we thought of creating it as an ongoing or continuous learning uh, journey was very much um, a no, uh, you know, and then non-negotiable because we, we really uh, deemed that to be important for aspiring battery professionals. And there's a series of ways in, in which we kind of um, help guarantee that. But one of, of those is again, by facilitating and, and ensuring that we build a community of battery professionals and enthusiasts, we actually en enable a space for that kind of organic knowledge exchange to happen. And so that's in, in part hosted by DISCO, but in other ways as well, once the community has grown, we see that the continuous exchange of knowledge continues beyond the 12 weeks that the you know course runs to. So yeah, that it's been a, a kind of an incredible thing to also see the, the community take on some of that uh, you know, knowledge exchange on its own. Yeah, and, and I, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead, Simon. Maybe just a really quick thing to add, and I think I mean, I mean, in some ways as well, and I think just from the audience, right, I'm not sure everyone here is a battery enthusiast, you know, as, as, as us, but I think, you know, this really applies for many different sectors, right, and I think, you know, I think the really strong focus was is on the people, right, I think that what it comes down to and really look at their journey and see kind of, you know, kind of, you know, um, get them to the program, when, you know, when they feel ready, but they join the program at very different stages as well, right, we have this early stage, you know, students, very bright and very driven and ambitious, they want to, you know, you know, change the world, which is fantastic, which we want to enable them to. At the same time, we also have the C level, right, of the biggest OEMs in this world and big companies also joining us. And they really want to also kind of, you know, learn maybe also, you know, from what's kind of the state of the art going on right now, but also share some of the experience as well and have this dialogue. So I think, you know, really, if, as long as you focus on the individual and see, like, how can you help them to progress? Then you can also, as Amelie said, right? Maybe people really going to grow with you over time, and we have seen this in many different stages where people join at one given time, but they stick around because you know they want to keep learning, they want to keep growing, and as long as you look at the person as an individual, there will be so much growth also happening. Yeah, I remember one of the things you mentioned was that like you know your students were asking, the learners were asking they were kind of sad when things were, when the program had ended, like they wanted more, they wanted more connection, they wanted more knowledge, more, more interaction. And so you, you've responded to that by building this incredible community and community does really feel like it's at the heart of what you're doing. And, you know, you also mentioned that community building itself requires a lot of time and education. And I know that you've put in a tremendous amount of work in diversifying your community by offering scholarships. I know that you, you know, interview every single applicant that applies to your program. Can you just share a little bit more about how you're approaching, not just building your community, but engaging them pre-program, during the program, after the program, and then how are you also growing your community? Great, yeah, I can start there in terms of, um, so I guess, as you say, the engagement actually starts very early on. One thing that was clear to us is because we had this community in mind from the get-go was to be intentional with the way we grew the each cohort. And so that's kind of where also the, the need to have interviews came in. But 
you know, interview is really a two-way street. So we also get to learn about uh, each and individual participants' expectations, and we can reflect on those and and see what also is needed from you know the different profiles that we have. Uh, granted, that we see some entire industries also transitioning into the you know whether that's automotive into the e-mobility sector or oil and gas into batteries. So. We, that gives us also a chance to be more in tune with, with the needs of the participants who take the course. So I guess the engagement really starts there. Um, and then we you know maintaining a, a high level of engagement, as you say, in building a community is actually a very, you know, it, it takes a lot of time and effort. So that's something we continue to improve on all the time and every day. Um, I'll just mention on, on the scholarship front, you're exactly right. I think to be intentional also required to take you know, particular steps. And so we built a scholarship to essentially ensure that we could have those diverse forces in the program. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't always happen organically. So the scholarship was just a way and, and a method to, to do that outreach to underrepresented profile in the sector. That's something we're very proud of that we'll continue doing because to us, you know, the, the sector is diverse. And a training like this and its cohort should be representative of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate how much intentionality you're bringing to diversifying your community. And I think the, the level of curation that you're providing for your learners, I think oftentimes when we're building and growing community, we often kind of throw out, throw out a net and, and catch what we can, but mm -hmm. it's really, really valuable to think about not only who is my ideal learner, but you know, how can we curate a group that is more equitable and uh, you know, a representation of the world we wanna see. So I really, really appreciate that approach. Um, I wanna chat a little bit about marketing because this ends up being kind of the biggest pain points that we've seen founders and operators of academies, boot camps, and micro schools face. Like it's really, you know, once you have an amazing product and as you're building it out and, and creating different iterations, you have to market and sell it as well. And so I'm curious to understand, like, how did you approach marketing in the beginning and how are you approaching it now? What are some of the, the very practical steps and, and actions that you took to actually attract and convert your ideal learners? Well, that's, I think that's a, such an important point. And as, as you say, it's always often overlooked, right? You think about, you want to create a great training program, you want to help people, but how do we actually get, you know, yeah, in front of these people and how we get them excited? And I think we really started very much organically, which I think is the, you know, the approach you want to take because, you know, also from, from a financial perspective, right? You really want to keep it as, as low as, as it makes sense. So we really started very organically, you know, on LinkedIn, you know, just talk about it, build up a presence there, which really helped us a lot. But also have a podcast where essentially we ran this for about every week for about a year, like really the, the past year. And a lot of people found us through that. And there was never really the idea that this would be a way to kind of also get, you know, people excited about the Bachelor MBA. But in retrospect, we have lots of participants who told me, and it's always really amazing to hear the stories that they, they know, I feel like everything about me or us as the podcast host, you know, and they, they know all our stories for like, because they literally listened to us for, for a very long time, often many months, you know, and of, the, of this content. And um, that's what's really nice because we gave them something already ahead of time, um, you know, some great content insights, but then they were like, okay, but then we researched what you actually do. We found out you're doing this program, right? And we can maybe learn from, from that. So this was a really nice way in some way of a marketing, but it wasn't really intended this way. And it kind of, you know, worked out by itself. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, now, of course, we're also growing, you know, kind of, you know, um, you want to go into like paid marketing, something we also with LinkedIn, we have done more, but again, here we're using it quite strategically, right? I think, um, for us, you know, I think it, it gets very expensive if, if you want to do marketing and especially for this kind of new niche markets. So for us, it's really about how can we be intentional and find the profiles which we don't get through our organic reach. So now we have quite an organic presence for a lot of participants. Again, you know, we have participants from Tesla and Volkswagen, Nissan, we touch a lot really from big brands and they themselves have a big following. And, you know, just by them having on their profiles, a lot of people find us. But often, and Amity mentioned this, we want to find these less represented backgrounds from all these regions where we don't have people from yet. Now we're about 30 countries in, but we still believe, you know, we have to get 160 countries more. So how do we do that? And that's something that really, you know, targeted marketing comes in to really mm -hmm. target these regions. Another thing also from less represented profiles like women, you know, that's a big issue if we see also like in the in industry, right? So how can we really find these profiles? And this is where we did this targeted marketing comes on. And I think we still always want to grow organically because realistically, that also makes more sense financially. So yeah, so both, but really intentional again for which kind of profile you want to target. 
Yeah, I think that's such a great point about kind of the organic marketing and then the paid ads. Can you go into like a little bit more detail? Because I think sometimes it's hard to know if and when to do the paid ads. And so what, what was your decision-making process at what point on the journey where you're like, okay, now we, we need to invest in some paid ads? Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. It's also something we just did recently, right? I mean, we kind of more, um, or like rather recently, and I think, you know, we're really trying to iterate as well and learn from it. And again, I think it's not really, you know, our main channel. I would still say more people find us organically. But I think it's, I mean, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts and everyone talks about this, right? If you really want to scale, you want to go into ads. Um, I think, but you want to really, you know, I think what's beautiful if you can, um, so I think one thing we looked into, right? How can you retarget, right? So we have people already find us, but then they forget about it again. And I absolutely get it, right? I see so many things, I find some interesting. So how can we get, for example, um, you know, kind of make it known again that people already followed us before? So we're doing a lot of events, also again, free events, et cetera. And we can use, you know, like marketing to kind of show to them again and say, now actually it's a good time to apply if you want to join. Because I think that's much more efficient than rather showing to someone who never heard about us. So it's also really kind of just notifying people about, oh, look, now actually you can apply, right? Because you only do it three times a year. So we don't want to kind of do this push, right? When, okay, now it's open. So really kind of when people already found us before, how can we then let them know about the, the new cohort starting? And so I guess when it comes to the to the organic referrals, how are you like activating the alumni community, right? Because you mentioned like there's these really incredible learners that are part of your program and, and they are also bringing in these other folks who are interested in this program as well. So are you incentivizing them to post? Like, tell us a little bit about how that engagement is going with your alumni. No, that's a, I, that's a great question. And I was, you know, gonna suggest that we talk about that because as you say, I think for us to, to um, really take care and, and put energy and effort into building a community means that we can uh, have the luxury of having also recommendation and organic ones. So we, um, we work a lot on, on LinkedIn in that our community of professionals tends to be on LinkedIn. And so having them take the program usually means that they will, will encourage them, but obviously uh, nobody is, uh, it's not a requirement or anything, but they will usually post at the end of the program that they have taken the battery MBA because that's something that they're proud of in terms of you know upskilling uh, and in terms of having achieved a level of, of uh, uh, technical knowledge in, in, a, in a very new still sector and and so we find that giving them the tools for example could be as simple as, as a banner but having that then visibility is just um, you know uh, yeah, it, it just happens uh, like that by, as I said, encouraging uh, them to post, but not none of it is, a, of course, a requirement. And then it goes into, uh, you know, as well, organic referrals. So we've been uh, trying to incentivize those more recently. Um, and that also is a great way to uh, reach to, uh, you know, people who from whom we may not have too many uh, country represented. So we found that, yeah, for sure, recommendation testimonials have been great ways to uh, to grow our reach. Yeah, it's definitely like, you know, here as well, we, we think through referrals and organic referrals a lot. And we find a lot of the kind of guests that come on the show are also talking about incentivizing alumni, but not in not in, a, in an unnatural way, in a way that feels like, you know, if they have an incredible experience, most learners actually want to share that with other people, right? It feels like an act of service. It feels like an act of generosity to say, I had this incredible experience. You might be interested in this too. And there's so many platforms that we could be using for this type of content. And I know, you know, based on what you're saying from the top of funnel, you're definitely, you know, using the live events and you've got kind of the, the email lists and and so is there anything that you would recommend for folks who are just, you know, building the emerging boot camps and academies when they launch their course, what should they be focusing on first from a marketing standpoint? I think that's a great question, but also I think it really comes from kind of, you know, know your audience well. I think that really helps us. And that was, you know, our, our strength. Um, I think there's a few things also because you mentioned on this referrals, right? I think one thing we're really proud of is that so far we have about 97% recommendation rate from past participants, which also makes us very proud and we know, right? Like, you know, alumni, of course, are great kind of, yeah, you know, spreaders of, of the news. Um, another thing is, and I think that's actually maybe an anecdote, and I think I mentioned to you before as well, that I actually went to one of your sessions like this before, and we had a representative from OnDeck, and he was talking a lot about, you know, how can you really, 
and provide also you know um, like a like a service to to the people who apply. Like, what can you offer to offer to the people? Which I found really fascinating thought. I never thought about it this way. I thought a lot about you know how can we keep you know supporting our people when they went through the program afterwards on my but other way around, like how can we help people beforehand? And of course, we already have the podcast, which is great and some way led into that. But also now one thing we started doing is create something called we call open case study. So we, we developed this case study track, which is something we also added to the program rather recently. And the participants developing incredible case studies as part of it, uh, which really blew us in mind. We're super excited about. And now we're selecting some of the, you know, the, you know, the most prominent ones from the, from the cohort. And we invite the participant to actually present it to people interested you know, in the program, but also people just interested in the topic um, recovering. So we have these open case studies and we invite all these people who maybe apply, but they don't, you know, they maybe cannot participate for whatever reason. Um, and we invite them to this session and say, come, please join us for that. And a lot of people do that. It's not really a really conversion funnel in this way. You know, it's really about just providing something extra. And of course, if people then think, okay, this is great. I want to get the full deal. I join the program. But we also think about this kind of service. I think that's really... Also for the podcast, I would do it 100% again, right? Like it's a lot of effort, but it's also so easy in some way. I mean, the only thing it needs is really is your time and of course dedication, but I mean, financially it's essentially free, right? There's enough platforms like Anchor, et cetera. You record it, you put it up and over time you build your following. We started also doing our podcast on Clubhouse. This was kind of our approach when Clubhouse was very hype at the time. I think now we maybe not, you know, too many people on there anymore, but I think we are still loving it. And we have a quite a loyal community on Clubhouse where we do the podcast with. And this is his own community. And now a lot of the Battery MBA alumni are coming to this as well because they want to hang out, right? They want to you know, still interact. So they join us on this podcast. And then they would share again stories from the Battery MBA, which gets other people interested again to check this out. So it's kind of this nice circle. Really, you know, keep providing you know, service and people will kind of appreciate it. Yeah, it's like you've really created this incredible flywheel. And I think what you're kind of speaking to, which definitely resonates here with us at Disco, is this like this concept of building trust with the learner. And so, so much of the marketing efforts and the community building efforts are actually about building trust with the, with the learners and with your community. And then that trust then, you know, is able to branch out in all these different ways that you might not have even planned. So it's quite incredible. And, and it does take a, a tremendous amount of time. I think that's one of the things you're speaking to as well. It's like, it takes time and effort to you know, market your courses and to build your community and to grow your community. And so you've just done a, done a really incredible job of like really nurturing what you've created over the past year and a half. And one of the things that I know that comes up quite often in the in kind of the marketing process is, is pricing your course. And I know when you first launched um, Battery MBA, it was like 500 euros and you know you were you were incentivizing learners with a few different things. So can you chat about kind of a little bit how you started with that pricing, what the, what, the, what the mentality was there, what the mindset was, and then how you moved to now it being 2,000 euros to be a part of the 12-week program. Well, I can start here briefly, and then Simon, maybe you can expand, but just the, the first thought is that um, one thing that really maintains in our focus is to make this uh, knowledge and this information accessible. So the reason for starting at 500 was that we knew that this we wanted to reduce uh, to the maximum the obstacle that people would face in, you know, just engaging with the content. And a side note on that, you know, Disco has been very beneficial to us in making sure we actually reduce the amount of effort that we put into the admin and the actual, you know, administration of the course and that we could actually focus on content. So just a, a side note here to say that that has actually helped us in maintaining the, the course fee uh, very low. And yeah, Simon, if you want to expand on, on the course structure. Well, thanks, Simon. I definitely, definitely can vouch for that as well with Disco saving us a lot of time on the admin, which is great. Um, I think, I mean, pricing wise, right, as I mean, you mentioned, I mean, you want to kind of, yeah, you know, we, we're trying to be, you know, kind of, you know, real about, you know, the service we're creating, right? And I think in the beginning, um, you know, the people, participants would only get the, the you know, the lectures, et cetera, we had at this time, right? So they got like 10 lectures or so. But then what we decided on is that every, you know, upcoming cohort would already have access to all the previous recordings. They all changed, right? So they, you know, the second cohort had like 20 lectures, 10 recorded, 10 live. The third one had, you know, 20 recorded lectures, 10 live. So actually there's a lot of value additional created. Then we also had these ideas such as, you know, the, the case studies we wanted to use, like our own battery MBA case studies. 
this needs another person, right? It really focuses on our team to do that. So that's extra cost. We have to incorporate. That means, right, we have to increase the pricing. And what's kind of interesting is, in the beginning, as Amin said, we want to keep the pricing lower because we want to make it more accessible and get people in. But also what happened over time is we had more and more companies also who wanted to send their people. And they're not too concerned about this pricing. They're more con you know, concerned about this being a solid program, et cetera, on these things. So you know, the, the top pricing is really there also for the companies. And we still, I think one idea also, the last increase we did was really also with the idea we want to be able to be more flexible on scholarships. We want to be able to give more scholarships, also more of the partial scholarships. So by raising the prices, which is kind of also paid a lot by you know, the companies who kind of send their people, we can also give more individual scholarships again to, to people around the world. So that's really, we can subsidize essentially, you know, because scholarships for us, we should also clarify this as us taking this money, right? We don't have other companies at the moment paying scholarships still something we want to develop into, and we have lots of discussions on that. But for us, it just means we, you know, we make the program more affordable for people where we believe that makes sense. So that's kind of on the pricing, I think, strategy, which was in there. Maybe one last thing. Of course, we're also monitoring the market a lot. And I think that's very important as well on pricing, right? We talked to a lot of the companies, we talked to a lot of individuals. One feedback we get a lot is that people think we should charge more. That's an interesting comment to get from participants, but we get this all the time that they're like, this value is more than what you're charging for. But we also talk to companies a lot. We know their budgets, educational budgets. We know the people we're working with. We know the individuals we work with. And if we would increase right now, for example, we would narrow it more down. So we would have to other find other creative ways to not for, lose the people we're still getting today and we want to keep getting. So yeah, I think being flexible and dynamic is quite important in these discussions. That's actually like such an interesting uh, you know, point that you made that it's like folks are saying, you should be charging more like it, it actually doesn't feel like enough for what you're providing which also feels like a really sweet spot for you're providing so much value in your program that that people feel that it, it they would be willing to pay more for it you know and so i think that's that's actually a really good problem to have in the sense that you can potentially continue to um, explore increasing prices but i also really appreciate the the approach of saying you know what we're going to use some of these um, full price tickets or full price registrations to then subsidize some of these scholarships which is also a really incredible strategy to make the program more accessible to folks who may not be able to you know pay the full amount so again i really really think that like so much of the work that you're doing around accessibility and equity in your program is just like deeply ingrained in the system that you're building. So really, really recommend that other folks also, you know, approach it from that perspective is like who is in our community and how can we make this experience more accessible for them. You also mentioned something really interesting around kind of raising the price around who do we need to then op continue to operate kind of this growing entity. And so when it comes to scaling and growing your team and your operations, like how have you approached that so far? And do you have any advice on like when to start hiring roles and what roles to hire for? We'd like love to learn a little bit more about that from you. Thanks. Uh, I can maybe start. Um, I mean, feel free to jump in and add. I mean, do a lot also as chief of staff on this topic. So. I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, you want to start as nimble as you can. And I think that's kind of, you know, where you start. And also, as I mentioned, right, we, we kept expanding. So really what we're providing now as a program is very different to before. I think it's good to kind of know, you know, aspirational where you want to go. Um, but I think you want to, you know, start small. I think otherwise you run into this problem that you have to, you know, scale too fast. At least this was our approach to kind of keep it, keep it organic, but that's also our decision, right? We're not, um, you know, um, growing with, with equity on this. Um, investment but i think yeah i think this was kind of the approach to kind of do it organically um i mean i'm super excited now that we have more people and we have people like our colleague mayana for example does a lot of the you know the heavy lifting and um, also on the case study tracking these kind of things and i think it's so nice when you kind of can grow into this maybe one thing also kind of want to add to this because you know we spoke about um you know increasing pricing i think something else we're also planning for the coming years before we actually have this unlimited subscription of getting unlimited access to all the kind of you know new recordings and things which we're providing but for next year we're also planning to actually create a subscription where people can get you know additional content and different things we're going to add onto it and they can you know kind of pay like a subscription when they finish the program this is again a very exclusive offering to people who went through the program that they can as you said right people want to stay involved we can provide other service to them which also allows us right to not kind of increase maybe price upfront but we can also allow other additional services which again hopefully many companies will pay for because they will see the value that their people keep updated always stay up to you know to the latest knowledge 
because there's not that many places who spend so much time, I think, to always stay on the on the top of it, right? And we're really investing so much time and resources into understanding what's you know the latest knowledge we can provide to our participants. So that's also one way we kind of look into it now, not just the program itself, but maybe what could come after and what additional services we can also provide to alumni. And that of course also means then you know the lifetime value, which of course people also talk about can increase as well. Exactly. And I'll just add on that that. Um, the reason why also we're looking into creating things out of the battery MBA is also because the knowledge is here, the community is here, and we're very keen on actually not increasing the number of participants per cohort. So instead of thinking of scaling it like that by just increasing the number of participants who join us, you know, every every uh, other um, month almost, we're thinking of other ways to make this uh, kind of to, to package this information and to make it accessible. So um, another thing that was in, you know, mentioned by seminar, for example, bespoke training or looking at particular regions or aspects of the battery sector. I mean, there's so many ways in which, you know, there's so much information and so many ways in, in which you could uh, address and engage with this content. So we're just thinking of, you know, innovating there in terms of, yes, how we can provide this information in different ways rather than just scaling it in a very kind of traditional way, but at the cost of losing some of the quality that we offer through, you know, fairly small cohorts. Yeah, I, I totally hear you. It's like, again, coming back to that intentionality, it's like, why are we doing this and who does this serve seems to be a question that you, you ask yourselves quite often. Um, you've mentioned this a few times and I haven't directly asked about it yet, but you are using Disco to build Battery MBA and and grow battery MBA. And I, and I know that before that you, you know, we're kind of putting together different tools. Like I'm, I just would like, what has it been like to go from not using Disco and then using Disco as your platform for building your live learning empire? And what has really been the most useful, helpful part of using this all in one platform for your community? Yeah, I can start here. And again, it's a, it's a very genuine comment, you know, so we, we um, moved to Disco because we, we, we needed help in, into, um, you know, basically a, a platform on which we could run the program, which would uh, minimize the kind of time and effort we put into the admin, as I mentioned earlier, but also would increase our time in terms of content creation and things like that. So for us, we reached a turning point and Disco was really, honestly, the best platform we looked at in terms of uh, enabling us to do just that. Uh, you know, in terms of functionalities, I think there, there's quite a few, um, and I'll, I can let Simon expand on that as well. But I mean, just the fact that everything is accessible in on the platform itself, um, the fact that people can also, um, something we, we've stopped doing in that last cohort, for example, is producing a lot of the content ourselves in terms of, you know, participants booklet and things like that, because we do think that uh, the platform is user friendly enough for people to engage with it, see other people's profile, um, and we do uh, still, you know, handle the interactive part of the uh, program on a different platform. Uh, but but that may change. Uh, one thing on on a more personal note that I've really enjoyed with this go is also, uh, you know, how dynamic and, and responsive they were to uh, working with, uh, you know, startups like ourselves and companies who are eager to, to try new things. And so I think that that relationship has really been a very uh, big positive for us in, in working with Disco. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, in terms of, yeah, concrete functionalities, I'm, I'm trying to think as well, Simon, if there's anything you want to add there. Happy to know. I think there's there's a few things, right? And also, I think the important thing is when we looked at different platforms. And I really remember when also you know when we met with your team the first time, it was so beautiful because they asked us like, "What are you using right now?" And it was like, "Okay, we're using Zoom, we're using Slack." And they're like, "Okay, that's what we're running Disco on." It's like perfect. So it was you know I think that was kind of natural because we also of course I think both sides went through the process. You know what I like the platform we want to use, and we ended up on the same. And the beautiful thing with Disco is really create a platform around it. And like, you know, essentially, I mean, I think the main thing for me is really about notifications, reminders. I think that's a massive time sink. Just like always have this regular scheduled emails to send, you know, follow-ups. And this is like fully automated. And I think that's the key, right? We really want to make sure that people don't forget about sessions. Also the calendar, massive thing not to forget. We had like a manual, I mean, it's by a lot of time. I remember in the early days, creating this Google Calendar was an absolute pain. And now that people can download it themselves as their time zones, also for Outlook. You know, you found a clever way to integrate both Google, you know, calendar as well as Outlook, which is also important, especially for some of our corporate clients. So I think yeah, these are the main ones for me. 
um, calendar as well as reminders, which doesn't sound too much, but it really saves a lot of time because if you have but a big cohort, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's a big thing. And then yeah, that Slack is integrated. I think is beautiful as well. And also you're extending your own platform. But yeah, it's, it, really, it was very easy for us to onboard in this way because we literally used the two tools, Slack and Zoom already, and they're both perfect integrated in your platform, so they work well. Well, thanks so much for sharing your experience. I mean, it's been such a, an incredible honor to have you use the platform and to you know, have that relationship where we're kind of co-creating and, and taking in your feedback and understanding what your needs are so that we can continue to build out the product that is most aligned with your needs. Um, and, and really, I think you, you pointed to something really, really important, which is that it saves time. It's one of like, it's, it's easy to operate. There's a seamless aspect to it just for you and for the learners, but it's also saving so much time. So you can focus on the things that are really important to running your business and running your courses and your programs. And I'm, and you know, as you continue to scale, I and mean, one of the things you talked about was maybe bringing in a subscription model and like continuing to offer different programs. How do you think that Disco is going to help you in scaling Battery MBA? Thanks. So maybe I can start here. Anything you want to add? I mean, I think, yeah, I think that's really important also about this co-creation, as you mentioned. That's why it's just really nice to work with like, you know, partners like yourself, where you can have this, you know, happening. We have seen a lot of kind of things like subgroups, for example. Remember, you know, when this was a discussion, you know, and now it is real. So we can have subgroups, which really helps us a lot. For example, we have this case study track, not everyone takes it, so they can use the subgroup, so that's perfect. From the scaling perspective, as you say, so we are just waiting for you to unlock some of these new features. Subscription, we have a big hope for it for, for next year, as we mentioned, and I think that's really for us, realistically, right? I think it's really beautiful to see these new things um, kind of becoming available and also really enabling us to do different things. Another example I might want to share, and we didn't talk about it before too much, but we also running, for example, other events. We did a hackathon um, earlier this year in March, where we also used Disco 4, and it worked out well as too, right? So we're also now really trying to test the platform for kind of different things we're doing and testing. Um, and I think this worked quite well. I mean, the subscription is really something we hope can be, for example, facilitated through Disco. I think there could also be other customers who might would enjoy something like this. Networking also, I think there's a big potential there. And we spoke about this before as well. You know, how can you facilitate some of these networking functions? So I think, you know, in the long term, let's hope there's only Disco and does everything. But we also, <laughs> I think a startup like you, so we or like, you know, we, we know this is a process. Um, and I think, you know, ready now, it, it, it saves a lot of time. It's also peace of mind. It's, I think it's not just time. It's good to know that you don't have to send this email one hour before to remind someone. It's, it's time, but it's also peace of mind. So I think that's an important combination as well. But yeah, I'm not sure if there's anything you want to share or add, Amani. Well, no, but that ties really well with what Nikki and you mentioned in terms of trust. So if you want to spend time, you know, building a community around trust, you also require, you know, reliable tools and, and platforms like that. We're also in an age where, you know, at the risk of sounding cliche, but we really need to reinvent the way we offer information online. There's an incredible fatigue around that. So virtual learning is, I mean, there's so many, I think also channels that we haven't yet explored. So making, finding new ways to make the content interactive, finding new ways to help people engage, uh, to, to interact with one another. I mean, there, there's a lot of unexplored territories and, and things that we're already doing, but I think, yeah, that, that's where uh, we hope to continue, uh, you know, working with Disco. And, and I think that's where I see a lot of the scaling potential. I mean, we're totally on the same weight page. We are definitely, our entire vision is to be the all-in-one platform so that you don't have to go out and be using multiple tools and really thinking about like social learning, right? We're not a course building platform, we're a social interactive experiential learning platform. And, and I think like very much aligned with where you're going with Battery MBA. Now, um, I wanna wrap this up, but I have one more question, which I always find is like very insightful. What is advice that you would give yourself if you were to go back, knowing what you know now, before you started Battery MBA? What, what, what would you tell yourself knowing what you know now? And maybe we can start. I think one is like, yeah, I mean, look what tools are out there and find partnerships. I think yeah, definitely Disco would have helped us in the beginning. Um, that's out there, but maybe that's a bit too cliche. But I think, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, just also, I think just starting, I think this is very important. I think often we think about, you know, creating something like this. And if you don't try, you don't know, right? And I think we also had lots of questions. People even, they're wondering about our name. They were wondering about our structure. They were wondering about pricing. I mean, I had so much feedback in the beginning, people just worrying about many things. And I think there's also fair concerns. Always good to have, you know, be, be mindful. But I think just giving it a try, I think that's that's the important bit. And very happy we did. But yeah, I'm not sure if anything else you want to share, Marlene. 
Well, I would say um, also the, the, the idea that holding true to, to one's value and to the company value, but for us, that meant that um, that also entailed, for example, slowing down some of our, our scaling or progress. So staying true to a vision of, you know, offering an accessible core that's, uh, you know, catered to very diverse participants with a diverse cohort, that's gender balance, that's uh, also highlighting profiles of people who tend to be underrepresented. I mean, we had a very huge mission and, and vision, but I think holding true to that and, you know, in, in really to, to thanks to, to everyone on the team. And I think Simon is, uh, was always very, uh, you know, crucial in carrying that, that vision, but has at times meant that we slowed down and we slowed down the way in which we also thought of even scaling the battery MBA. But I think looking back, it's one of the things I'm most proud of. And yeah, I'm, I think that's the, the, the advice I would give. And, and it's yeah, very important one. Thank you. And that and that mission and vision is to create a more sustainable world, you know, and I think you are doing that. And we're so honored to be doing that with you in any way that we can support. And thank you so much for being here today for your time and for all the practical insights that you shared with us. And yeah, we're, we're looking forward to growing with you. And hopefully we'll have another conversation on live learning empire soon as you continue to scale battery MBA. Thank thanks you so much. much, Nagin. Thanks for your time. And yes, thanks for everything you do as well. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us here live. We will have this recording available to you as well as an article that you can read with all of the key takeaways. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you soon.